Hi, I'm Dr. Michio Kaku. I'm a professor of theoretical physics here at the City College of New York, which is part of the City University of New York, and this is where it all happens, right here at the college in Manhattan. First, you have to know what you want to write about. That's the most important thing about a book. You have to have the kernel, the idea, as clear as possible in your mind. Then you type up a proposal and you send it off to an editor at a, at a big publishing house. Assuming it gets accepted, then the process is you have to do research. And over there you can see piles and piles of research notes that I get to make sure that everything is accurate. So you spend literally months at a time going through all the literature, going through the books, going to libraries, going to the web to make sure that your information is authentic. Then you have to write the manuscript. And this is what a typical manuscript will look like. We're talking about a manuscript here that runs about 500 pages, double-spaced, and this is basically the book. Writing a book is almost like giving birth to a baby. You have to do draft after draft after draft to get it exactly right. You have to look at the same sentence over and over again to make sure it's perfect. And so the number of drafts you go through, if you were to stack it up, would be about this tall. So that's the total number of drafts that you would have to go through before you finally get the book. You just can't do it on the first try. It's a process of polishing and polishing till you get it just right. And science books are different from novels. In novels, you have to worry about dialogue and action and pacing. For science books, you have to be very careful. Because on one hand, I'm a scientist. I know the science. It's like the back of my hand. However, the problem is to make it understandable to the average person. And so I begin to realize that when I have to take a theory and explain it to a high school kid, then I begin to realize that I don't understand the theory all that well. I begin to realize the problem is not the high school kid, the problem is me. I have to understand it backwards and forwards so that I can communicate it to somebody with no science background whatsoever. When I'm working on this manuscript, basically most of the time I'm just thinking by myself. Um, I have the chapters in my head, I have the sequence of ideas in each paragraph laid out in my mind, but the order's not right. So I begin to play with things in my mind. Once I sort of understand the order of which things happen, then I can simply go to the word processor and, and punch it out. Then you give it to the editor, who will then approve it or not, make changes, and then comes back the galleys. And this is what the galleys look like. They're all typeset. Everything is computerized these days. And it runs also roughly 500 pages. So these are the galleys, and then you can make final changes in this copy. Then finally, the book itself comes out. And when the book comes out, it comes out in different languages as well. Uh, my books are translated all over the world in different languages, Chinese, Korean. This, for example, is the Portuguese um, edition of Parallel Worlds. And I know where my books are published because people send me emails from all over the world. You have to depend on the translator to do an honest translation. Unfortunately, when my book was translated into Japanese, the translator thought he knew more than I did. And he started to inject his own personal comments and commentary. This is the worst nightmare you can possibly imagine, writing a science book where the translator thinks he's no, he knows more about the subject than you do and starts to interject his own point of view. Well, the book was published. It got right by the editor. And, uh, of course, the, the publisher and the editor had to apologize to me later. The relationship with the editor is very important because sometimes you could be going off in a, in a tangent in, in the wrong direction. And so what the editor does is, first of all, it, he puts you on the right track so you know exactly where you are reaching. You know where you're going to begin. You know where the end point is. And then the editor can map out where he thinks perhaps the book begins to deviate. Also, the editor is a non-scientist, which is very important, because you want a non-scientist to be able to experience the thrill of science in the making and to understand why it is so relevant. So if your editor can't understand it, no one can understand it, and it means you have to go back to the drawing board. On uh, Tuesdays, I put on a microphone, and I'm talking to 130 radio stations around the country that carry Science Fantastic. What kind of classes do you teach now? Right now I teach astronomy. 
Um, sometimes I teach in the graduate program. I teach grad students. We're in the planetarium of the City College of New York. In fact, it's the second largest planetarium in Manhattan, second only to the, the famous Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. Here, however, we can seat about 50 students and we give planetarium shows because we want kids to be fascinated about the universe they live in because it's their world. This is the universe they live in. And with the planetarium, we can recreate the stars, recreate the planets and the galaxies. We give regular planetarium shows to our kids. We talk about the space program, the exploration of the planets, stars, and galaxies. But my course has 300 kids, so you can't put 300 kids here. It's too small. So we have planetarium shows here where we try to take local kids from the neighborhood and show them that there's a huge universe out there. You know, so often, kids never look up. I tell the kids, look up. Some kids spend all their life looking at the ground. Look up. Look at the stars. See where you come from. See where you are with respect to this great universe of ours.